All right. Hello and welcome back to episode four of Three Sides to Every Adoption. Today it's Four Sides to Every Adoption. Uh, I'm Sarah Easterly. I'm an adoptee and sitting to my left is Ostrid Castro, who's also an adoptee. She's with Adoption Mosaic. And uh, Kelsey Vanderbilt Ranyard is here, birth mom. Hi, Kelsey. And Lori Holden, adoptive mom. Hello. So Hi. four sides today or extra adoptee side, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> An extra adoptee side. Um, so today's topic that we're going to tackle is um, problematic behaviors of adoptive parents. So um, not to single out the adoptive parents, but um, because we're going to do episodes on other parents um, and other things that are problematic, but um, we're going to start with the biggie because adoptive parents are the um, core kind of visible raising the day-to-day -day raising uh, adoptees and um, and thought we'd start with with that that group first um, if you will and um, just just talk through some of the things that can be really hard for us as adoptees and then Kelsey we'd love to hear some of the things that can be hard for you from the birth parents perspective um, and things that you've heard from others. Uh, again, this is, we're not monoliths. We're, we aren't speaking for everyone, but we'll talk about our experiences and, and other experiences we're familiar with. Um, first, I wanted to just say, um, welcome, Ostrid and I are together. This is so exciting, uh, uh, mm -hmm. post-pandemic, in-person, mm -hmm. uh, exciting time. And Ostrid, I, I was hoping you would just start talking a little bit. I was so happy to have met Ostrid very early on when I came to Adoption Land, pre-pandemic. Um, but but that you go back way back in this space mm -hmm. because you've been working in adoption land or adoption for 30 years. I know I hear you say a lot. So yeah. could you talk a little bit time. about that, about adoption mosaic too? Awesome. Okay. I'm going to look at you through this because this okay. is so weird and different and awesome and amazing. So I'm going to look at you over here. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> Because otherwise I get my side and this isn't the best side. I think, no, I'm kidding. Um, so uh, first of all, thank you all for having me. I love opportunities to work with the Adoption Constellation and other members of um, the Adoption Triad or um, extended uh, beyond the triad. I'm always looking for opportunities to have these conversations and roll our sleeves up and have some hard conversations. I think it's time, it's, um, it's way long overdue. Uh, and so um, I think uh, the work that I started off doing back in uh, the early 90s um, really was just stemming from my own personal experience of being an adopted person. I was 18, I was looking uh, for a place to kind of give back to my community, if you will. And at that time uh, in the early, uh, early 90s, the only place to really give back, if you will, um, was in uh, placements in working for adoption agencies. Uh, and I was at a time in my life where I was snowboarding professionally, not knowing what I was gonna do for my career and where what I was going to do for a living when I grew up. Um, so I thought, oh, you know what? I was raised in a family that um, taught me to volunteer and to give back to my community where I felt was um, appropriate. And I had, at that time, I felt like I had, um, and I still do, <laughs> makes it sound like I don't anymore, but um, I had a um, kind, loving family who adopted my sister and I at three and a half and excuse me, four and a half. I was four and a half and my sister was six. And, um, you know, well-meaning, kind people who uh, were kind of swept in at this, you know, fast-paced river of um, adoption is the cure to infertility. The adoption is um, the cure to childlessness. Uh, my parents weren't able to have children and, uh, and they wanted to. And that was their primary focus. It, there was no conversation whatsoever of what the other members of the Adoption Constellation were experiencing. So it was very tunnel vision, very focused on the adoptive parent experience and getting them in, getting them to a place where they could be parents and ha um, have that rite of passage to become parents because they felt like they had been, um, you know, the short end of the stick uh, by not uh, being able to experience 
uh, pregnancy um, and uh, birthing and, uh, and so forth. So, um, so my parents had decided to adopt and uh, there was an industry and an agencies at the time that just really fed into that uh, narrative, the rainbows and the unicorns narrative that's just clean slate adoption. Yes, bring home a four and a half and six year old from a develop developing country, um, children who don't speak English uh, and the parents don't speak Spanish and you guys will all just figure it out because love will conquer all, right? Uh, and so I came from that era, from that um, world. And I think at 18, I was still very much in that world of, you know, yeah, my parents didn't, they didn't get trauma. They didn't, I didn't even have the words for that, but they didn't get trauma. They didn't get race. They didn't get um, being raised in adoptee isolation and racial isolation. Um, they didn't know how to talk about any of that. They didn't know how to help us give us space to talk about our first four and a half, six years in Colombia. Um, and none of those things were on their radar. And so um, all of that being said, they did, I do believe they did the best that they could with the tools that they had. Now, does that, there's that flip side where does that mean that gives them license to stay in their own um, ignorance um, around those things? Absolutely not. Uh, and so as um, I entered into uh, working at adoption organizations, I started off at the Rocky Mountain Adoption Exchange uh, and, um, and just volunteering, shuffling papers around. And then somebody asked me to be on a panel for a, um, a waiting families. I don't even know if it was called that back then, but it was a waiting families group at the exchange. And uh, they said, you know, Astrid, you're a great storyteller. Can, you know, could you come to tonight's meeting? Like the day of, could you come to tonight's meeting and sit on a panel and talk about your experience? And I was the first adoptee that they had ever had um, that talked about, that came back. And I was the first uh, transracial adoptee, inner country adoptee that had come back and uh, spoke on this panel, kind of informal panel. Uh, had everybody sitting at the edge of their seats wanting to know every moment detail about my existence and what my parents did right and what they did wrong and how it could have been better and all of this and like the power that I was holding in that moment at 18 years old of like, oh my gosh, these parents are listening to every word. They're taking notes. I'd never had anybody, maybe a therapist um, taking notes in my life at the time, but nobody who was actually listening to some things that I had to say around the things that my parents could have done uh, differently. So fast forward, um, I have been in this uh, work ever since uh, I was 18 and um, and it was clear to me that placements uh, and working in adoptions in that realm was not something that uh, was possible for me. Uh, it was too emotional, it was too hard. And so I worked for the Oregon Post Adoption Resource Center after graduating from university um, here in Oregon. Well, I guess we're in Washington right now, but um, uh, in the North, Pacific Northwest, yes. Uh, and I worked at the, the um, Or Park for about five years before starting Adoption Mosaic. Um, and um, yeah, and it's uh, been, Adoption Mosaic has um, been around for about 15 years, uh, which seems crazy to say that. We launched uh, in 2005 as a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, it was me and three other adopt, or excuse me, yes, three other adopted parents. So there was four of us total that launched um, and started the organization. Uh, and the I was um, the face of the organization, if you will. I was I was the one who was providing workshops and trainings and consulting and um, starting groups uh, for adoptees and um, youth activity groups and things like that. And the other three women were kind of more behind the scenes, uh, helping with the 501c3, managing the board of directors, uh, and so forth. And so then we ran the organization for about. 10 years and in uh, 2015, we closed the doors um, as a nonprofit. And, um, and then I retained the, all of the, the name and the intellectual property knowing that I was gonna relaunch it at some point. 
but I had some things I had to figure out. Uh, I think that speaks volumes to, we might be doing this work uh, out there and helping and serving our community. And usually I've never met somebody who's doing this work that it's not personal um, and in it, as long as I've been in it, um, that it's, it's not, there's not a personal connection to the work that I do. And so um, I closed, we closed the organization and then I relaunched it two months into the pandemic, uh, like fully relaunched it uh, as an LLC. And, uh, and just before that, I had started doing um, some, and actually, uh, Lori, you and I, that's where we met, I think, for the first time in Colorado. My, um, I was planning to do, a, a, we run one of our most successful programs is We the Experts Adoptee Speaker Series. And, uh, and that's monthly. And I was doing one in Denver um, quarterly, in Seattle bi monthly, and in Portland monthly. It was amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, and the in person, oh, I miss that so much. It's just, it's a different feel for sure. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, just really quick, maybe I'll explain Adoption Mosaic. We are um, an organization that provides adoption education and support. Uh, I think the couple of things that are really important about who we are as an organization, um, we're not a placement agency. We don't play any part of placing children for adoption. Uh, we, outside of maybe some adoptive parent education, some agencies give parents some credits to attend some of our workshops. Um, and, uh, and then our, the other thing is, is that we don't take a stance on being pro-adoption or anti-adoption. Uh, we take a stance on making pro-informed decision-making. I always chuckle when I say that out loud. And it's funny, I'm just like realizing this right now, where that chuckle I think comes from is um, kind of the conversation that we're gonna have today is, is that it's really launched from this place of, we have historically not given parents or individuals an opportunity to make educated, well-informed decisions. Instead, it's emotion it has always been emotionally driven. And so the title of today's um, problematic um, behaviors, um, you, you bring, you bring a, a family together in this way, all of these moving pieces and these moving parts, and you don't give anybody the heads up about the good, the bad, the hard, um, cause I don't think any of it is ugly. I just think it's hard. Right. And we don't give people space to really educate and inform themselves about those parts of it. We just focus on the rainbows and unicorn aspects of it. So, um, there's a lot of work ahead of us, uh, in creating these spaces. So I'm excited to be here. Yeah, so glad you are. And I just wanted to say one more thing about Adoption Mosaic that I've been impressed by is that um, you have been able to reach people at all different stages of their adoption mm -hmm. parenting journey, right? And, and, and adoptees, so you have the We the Experts program for, we, for adoptees, but specifically since we're talking today about adoptive parents, what's so, um, I think, amazing about the spaces I've been able to help um, and be a fly on the wall and help support is um, that you've got people brand new considering adoption. Mm -hmm. You've mm -hmm. got uh, people with children anywhere from, you know, two till 20. And then you also have adult, you know, programming for our yeah. parents <laughs> our, our, of our generation. So um, it's pretty impressive. And um, I have been impressed. I've found so much healing being a part of mm -hmm. the adoption mosaic groups because these are parents who are really trying to become critical thinkers and trying to see all different sides like you, Lori, mm -hmm. and, um, and, and just getting informed and, and listening to us as a, it's a real honoring just having yeah. a space where we can say, oh, here's how we, that would land for us as adoptees and, and know that they're listening and that they're caring. Yeah. It's like doing right by their kids, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. You've seen over 30 years, you've seen a lot of, you've encountered a lot of different adoptive parents in mm -hmm. different circles. You've been encountered, you've done, you do consulting for adoptees as well. So mm -hmm. you hear about problematic things that the adoptees are struggling with. So um, let's, there's probably a lot of fruit we could just grab. Yeah. What's, what's one that comes to mind? Yeah, um, when, you, when you told me what the topic was, um, I thought to myself, so I have placed myself 
within this industry in a way where we attract parents who are parents who are really wanting to do right by their kids and wanting to do it differently. So what I mean by that is no part of our training is mandatory by, and, and this is the pros and cons. I'd love to hear um, others and what they think about this because um, I honestly really enjoy working with parents where this is not mandatory. Yet on the flip side, I think all of this should be mandatory. And I think, you know, we, and we could, we won't, but we could get into MEPA, the Multi-Ethnic Placement Act, and how that hinders our ability to be able to make some training around race and uh, race training for white adoptive parents um, before they adopt a child of a different race than their own, making some of that training and education re uh, required by every state. So we've got this law, and just in a nutshell, we've got law that makes that not possible right now, right? Um, across the board to make that training um, mandatory. And uh, the ones that I, the parents that I have struggled the most with are the ones who feel like they have been forced to come to these conversations. Uh, and the ones that, um, that are adoption mosaic, it's usually self-selecting. These are folks who say, I want to learn more. I want to hear from the adoptee community, the birth first parent community, adoptive parent. I want to, I want to be in community. This is really exciting. Uh, those are the people who I love rolling my sleeves up. And that's not to say that there aren't problematic things that are being said by those individuals, but they have this self-awareness of I don't have to be perfect. I don't have to get things right. I can mess up and Adoption Mosaic or Ostrid or the, her team are not going to shun me or make me feel bad as a result, right? Um, and so we are really fortunate in the work that we do, that we have parents who are, are self-selecting, wanting to be there, excited to learn, that changes. So every once in a while, we get a parent who ends up coming to a workshop because they haven't placed, they ha the, a child hasn't been placed with them. The agency is just giving a strong recommendation that maybe you want to go to one of Ostrid's workshops, right? And you get the, the parent that's sitting there like this um, back, well, back in the day, it was like in-person trainings. I would see parents like leaning back in their chair and their arms folded and like no nodding of the head, no um, uh, body language feedback. And, um, and I have always like kind of made a like, all right, by the end of the day, I really want to see if I can get you engaged. It's almost like a challenge because I really struggle with the idea that, um, that parents, uh, if they don't know what they don't know, how am I and why am I judging them? And it's after they've taken the, uh, the workshop, after they've been involved in community, after they've had practice, if they're still having that really strong sense of I, righteousness or I'm doing, um, there's nothing that, you, that you're saying that's helping me move forward. At that point, then I usually just end the relationship as far as like, we're probably not a good match. I Clearly, I'm not helping you, right? And so um, this is frustrating for everybody. So I, I kind of take this approach that um, if, uh, that's not to say that there are problematic, when problematic behaviors in adoptive parents who come um, to our workshops, absolutely, absolutely, without a doubt. And in general, I usually put it in a category of, I'm guessing you haven't been given a safe space to unpack some of this stuff. I'm guessing you haven't had um, somebody who wants to roll their sleeves up and, um, and kind of grow with you, or um, that's not always the case. And you know, take my rose colored glasses off sometimes, but <laughs> yeah. Um. When they're coming to Adoption Mosaic and they're struggling, um, it, for the parents who seek out Adoption Mosaic and they're struggling um, with, you know, and, and I'm thinking of a number of cases where it feels like the adoptees are older and saying, can you go to Adoption Mosaic because mm. I can't, it can't come from me. It's too hard to come from me as the child, um, even mm. if I'm an older child. But um, what are some of those problems that, bring them to Adoption Mosaic? 
Yeah, so I think that one of the things, so we have a new program that's called Season Parents, uh, and that is for parents who are uh, no longer actively parenting their children. The children are adults, um, are young adults sometimes, older adults, uh, but the, basically the adoptee has found their community and, uh, and has started practicing their own language, their own, and expressing their own thoughts and ideas and um, about their beliefs around adoption. And their parents are left behind, right? Their parents are not in community. Their parents are not exposed to this language. Their parents are not reading the books, going on Instagram, you know, learning as their kid is learning, right? So we're seeing this huge divide between the 20, mid 20s to, you know, 50s, 60s, where they're, they're online getting, I don't, uh, like, almost overstimulated by um, the, progress, the progressive voice of the adoptee and those of us who are wanting change and saying we need, we need to be talking about this differently. And then they're excited about some of these things. They go home or they're wanting to talk to their parent or their parent wants to talk to them about these things. And the parent has not been up to date on some of this language or some of this, these thoughts or ideas or philosophies or um, or different, different things that we're progressing to. And so what happens is we're seeing um, this huge divide between adoptees and adoptive parents, adults, adoptees and adoptive parents saying, it's not my job to teach you how to talk about adoption. It is not my job to teach you how to be adoption fluent or adoption competent or like I, or how to talk about race or racism. Guess what, mom and dad, like you missed the boat on that. I am now in my thirties and teaching you, um, you know, why all lives matter is problematic to our family and to use that rhetoric and to use like, I, 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 carrying that burden is too much for me because I'm not an educator. I am, but these these young adults or even older adults are saying, um, I that's I can't carry the burden of this, and so they're sending their families to Adoption Mosaic to attend seasoned parents. That in that training, me and a co-trainer who's a a parent of a. Um, four kids who are all in their 30s or older and uh and how she has kept up what she does to engage her kids and to stay in the in, in, within the industry language and industry standards and so forth and she's done a phen phenomenal job and I would say a big part of that has come from her experience of her kids saying it's not my job to educate and keep you up to date on this so go find somewhere where you can do that and there's no place for these parents none to go. So my parents are attending every single one of our workshops. You've seen them and they attend the We the Experts and uh, um, panel every month. I don't, I think if they're out of town, they might miss it uh, every once in a while. And um, we've done 32 of these panels and my parents are in most of them. They attend every workshop I've ever done. Um, and they just have jumped on board um, to be like, you know, commitment, a uh, lifelong commitment to just because you're adults and you're on your own doesn't mean that this education around adoption and race and racism and how you've walked through the world and how we have contributed to that, um, to that trauma, that pain, um, we need to own some of this and, uh, and we're here for it. So mm -hmm. the long haul, right? <laughs> I'm thinking of the curriculum from Tough Conversations, which I got to be a part of one of the one of your Tough Conversations mm -hmm. um, groups last year. And I'm thinking of the curriculum in terms of just kind of parents um, with younger children and some of the kind of mm -hmm. problem areas that you identify through that curriculum. And one that comes to mind is the how, how do you tell your adoption story? There there are some mistakes mm -hmm. that parents can make in sharing the sharing or not sharing those decisions uh, the adoptees um adoption story that one's a pretty mm. good one um what have you learned like in terms of like i know you've, you've come here a lot just lived experience as an adoptee mm. <laughs> as well as um as just through through engaging with parents but what what have you learned or some of the things to watch out for if you could summarize I think that's a big one, um, but mm. 
but um, sharing the, the adoptee's story or and deciding not to, what, when is it a problem? Mm. When is it okay? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's so many uh, spaces. Yeah. Well, there's so many spaces um, like, so sharing your child's story outside of your child. Um, that's, that's a topic and a conversation within itself. Right. Uh, and how do you, how do you share your story about what brought you to adoption as adoptive parents um, and tell that story without overexposing or telling your child's story? And yet everyone, you know, people, because especially, I'm going to say, especially in transracial families, the conspicuousness of our families uh, sometimes give people per, uh, permission or license to ask us really inappropriate, uh, very private questions about our adoption and um, and so I think that uh, we have seen lots of families overshare and tell their kids story um, before the kids have a voice to say hey that doesn't feel very good I don't want the stranger in the grocery store to know um, this part of my adoption or uh, and um, and then when they get older and they actually do have a voice we see a lot of them not using their voice because the story has already been told by their parents and they no longer like that they, they're so just like whatever my mom tells everybody like that's just who we are as a family um and to teach yourself and learn um what privacy and what um what you owe people and what you don't boundaries and healthy boundaries is such a challenge for so many of us adoptees in telling our stories um we have a tendency many of us have a tendency to overshare uh, because we were taught that that's what people, what our parents do is that they overshare and, um, and tell our story. So I think that that piece needs to be thought about and considered way before we're having thinking, maybe not before, but in unison with the idea of how am I going to tell my child their story? Um, but how am I showing up for my child outside of just that one-on-one -on -one conversation between me and the child? Um, so modeling that, modeling what it looks like to have healthy boundaries and having your child hear um, some, your parents say, oh, that's actually private, or that's actually their story, or that's our family's story, or that's, um, and uh, and that can be uncomfortable. That can be uncomfortable sometimes to, to do that. And yet, if you fast forward 20 years and you heard your 20 year old say, oh, that's actually private. Um, you know, I appreciate there's some books and there's people out there who do talk about this all the time. I'm guessing you're asking because maybe you have adoption in your life, turning the table and having the, the attention turned on to the person who's asking the story. There's so many different ways to go about, about how to do that. But if you have not been modeled um, by another community, adopt a parent or agency on what that looks like and how to do that, it doesn't come natural, especially for those of us who are talkers. I mean, you can tell I'm a talker, right? So like <laughs> those of us who I, ha I started my, my panel work and my career in this um, in this field, uh, oversharing and telling people things that I should have never shared about my own personal story and my um, my adolescence and why things were hard in my life. And um, but I had I had an audience who would listen, so I was like, all right, well, saves a lot of money on therapy. Um, I'll just go tell the whole world my private <laughs> life and. Uh, and then I'll feel like, oh, and you've heard people say this. I'm sure all of you have said this at some point. I used to say this all the time. If I can take the challenges and the traumas and the hurt and the pain of my own story and help somebody else not have that experience by sharing my experience, then I'm doing good in the world. I'm doing, I'm doing some, I'm giving back, right? Um, really, if you think about that, um, it shouldn't be boundless in the way we do that, right? So how do we do that with boundaries and still get to say that, but not overexpose everybody's story? I, I do wanna say that um, I have met very few, if any adoptive parents who don't have regrets about oversharing, especially at the beginning, because from our point of view, if you're coming to adoption through infertility, um, 
that moment when you think you're finally going to fill your arms is such a joyous moment and you, nothing about your path has been natural or normal and you want this to be normal. And so you tell people we're having a baby and they know you're not having a baby. And, and so you spill, you tell, and you don't have a, like you say, a boundary in place around that because you don't know that you should. So, uh, um, you know, we're going to put a bunch of things in the show notes. And one of the things I want to put in is echoing much of what you're saying, Astrid, about three things to ask yourself before you squeeze the toothpaste tube of your child's information that you can't get it back in. And one of them is, um, does this person need to know? And that, that doesn't, the yes or no doesn't have to inform whether you do or don't tell, just out of curiosity, figure that out. Second one is why am I telling? You know, if you're saying, well, her mom's too broke to take care of her or his dad is in jail, um, then you, and you're kind of feeling like the hero about that. Well, that's probably a good thing to be aware of is why are you telling? Is it for you or for your child? And then the third one is to try to put yourself, to try to project forward for your child a year or five years and see how could this come back and maybe not work out for my kids. So if you take those three steps before you spill, um, you might be able to make better decisions right from the front. And I am so grateful to adoptees who early on my journey, when I started to spill, they spanked me and they told me, you don't have a right to say this. And that hurt me, but I listened and, um, and I changed my behavior. I was just going to say, just because now we have social media, which has made things so much more different and complicated. And um, I think that it, internet etiquette is like ever evolving too. So this is like a thing that we're all learning along the way, but then you add in adoption etiquette, I suppose, and parenting etiquette, and you mix that in, and you're like, well, where's the line? And I've been totally guilty of oversharing my story as well and telling things that you just can't get back. And, um, but now I see like these whole accounts devoted to oversharing their children's stories on especially Instagram, TikTok. And it's like, oh my God, that kid is two years old or that kid's six weeks old or, and it's just, the internet is forever. And you are telling the story to hundreds of thousands of people or more and it's and then I think too I like what you said about how much you tell things you it kind of like by default gives people this license to ask more and I think that's the whole culture surrounding um the internet is oh, I'm a blogger. I'm telling you everything I do in my day. Here's every detail about my child's story. And then I see a lot of times I see people will ask a really like terribly nosy question that is inappropriate to ask. And that person with the account will be like, oh, don't you think that's too far? And, and like, you've literally never set a boundary with these people in your storytelling. Why would they think that's too far? And it's, I think that there's so much chance in circumstances like those, where it's like, this is a signal for introspection. <laughs> Maybe you need to think about the boundaries that you're not setting and think about what you should do to change that, so. I also am thinking about um, when uh, individuals who are considering adopting um, post, uh, you know, those kind of what I think some people call advertisements that we're looking for, you know, we're uh, looking to be parent, become parents and da, da, da. I, I thought about like, what would it be like to be an, a grown person and know that that's how you came about to be a part of your parents' family, right? Is to say, oh, they put on Facebook this, or they put on, um, and it happens uh, and I have no doubt mm, I will or have, there are people in my, um, in, in my track and in my world who maybe have done that without uh, the support of somebody who helps them to be a critical thinker about what, what is that going to look like when your child is 
20 or 30 or whatever, trying to understand their place in your family. We talk a lot about legacy at Adoption Mosaic um, and what is your legacy um, within this family structure that you're not biologically related to. Um, and, uh, and I think, I mean, that's like what we leave our kids, right? What, what are we leaving our kids? And what is, and the, one of the things that I think in t when your question about talking with, um, talking with families uh, that how we have overlooked the conversation and the dialogue of how my parents and why my parents decided to adopt. So the narrative I grew up with my entire life was, um, oh, your mom and I, we couldn't, your mom couldn't conceive and she couldn't have a baby. So we went to an adoption agency and we got you girls. Like that is, that is the narrative that I grew up with my entire life of how I became a part of my parents' family. And you unpack that and you sit down with the family and you sit down with my mom and dad and say, actually, I want to know, like, do you remember the day that you said, let's should we consider adoption? Who introduced you to this? Who were the social workers? Who was, what did grandma and grandpa say when you told them? What was this? Like, because that is legacy building. That is helping a child feel like they are a part of the, this is not something that happened in a, in, you know, in the car ride home from watching a movie, we decided we were going to adopt. And so then we did. Um, I mean, I hear these stories from adoptees all the time that is just like, it's so loosely talked about um, that it doesn't give us any bearings. It doesn't allow, allow well, us to put roots into and, the. And I want to add to that. I'm sorry, Austria, mm -hmm. just didn't mean to cut you off there. Mm -hmm. um, but it's all about, that's all about the adoptive parent's perspective. There, where's the adoptee's perspective? And that's forgetting that adoption is supposed to be about the children. And so what, what I heard in those stories, you were saying it's their perspective. So kind of the, your story begins when you were, when you came to us. And, and anything before that is often left out of the story in a lot of cases. So I think that's, mm -hmm. that's the big problem, right? Like there, <laughs> there's no pre-adoption history. And for you being adopted older, like where, where was the part of that story? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, and, or, and, and my, so much of my pre-placement story was nobody had access to, nobody knew, right? Uh, and so I, that, that I learned when I met my birth mother 11 years ago. Uh, and, um, and I think that I guess what I'm saying is, is in that, um, that narrative that we tell children and when we're talking about how we became a part of this family and where that, was, where that seed was planted is, is way bigger, a bigger story than what we historically have told children. Um, and, uh, and yes, of course, like then telling the child there, I mean, it's almost like two tracks and at some point these two tracks kind of meet, right? And then we can talk about the family and how we grew and how we developed and how we integrated adoption into our family unit along the way. But these two tracks um, don't meet up until later, right? Um, and so, I just, um, we have a, a training that is called Path to Now, and the entire six weeks is helping parents unpack the, their narrative of how and why they decided to adopt, because they, at some point, deserve, owe that to their children to tell their children that story. Um, I believe they owe that to their child along the way, that it shouldn't be at a grown-up age that you'll learn about this, but that there's always an age-appropriate way to, to talk to a kid about something regarding adoption. Um, I'm thinking of another one from the curriculum and that was um, uh, family tree, like mm. problematic, um, you know, it's kind of goes hand in hand with that, but there are some problematic ways to handle the family tree and some, some really good ways to handle the family tree. Um, what in yeah. your experience kind of works the best in that one? Yeah, well, you were part of that class <laughs> yeah. where we saw some family yeah. trees um, that, uh, that were so integrative as far as like a lot of times um, we encourage families to do family trees that, inc and that includes the roots. Um, I mean, we always think you should include the roots because without roots, a tree doesn't, or a tree or a flower or whatever image 
Um, and so um, including birth family uh, I, and including even people say, but we don't know, we don't have any information. Well, we know that um, until, you know, um, until it, this changes, it takes a sperm and an egg. And, uh, and so where, you know, you can start from there that you have birth mother, birth father, birth grandparents, birth great grandparents, and us adoptees are really delayed in understanding that we have birth grandparents, birth great grandparents, and our lineage is just as long as everybody who was born into their family. It's just not with the same family um, genetically. So I think including that and figuring out how to talk about that with your kid um, is grounding and important and to leave it out uh, is, um, I think, can be really problematic and really challenging for a child to grow up and not feel like they came into this world in the same way biologically that everybody else comes into this world. And I think um, I think that's really, all of these to me almost have a theme of they're problematic unto themselves, but they're also problematic on the larger level. And like we talked to at the beginning, Ostrid, of um, silencing us and leaving us alone in a lot of confusion to try to navigate this before we're developmentally able to articulate why they're problematic. So it's better to know the problems mm -hmm. ahead of time as a parent so that you're not leaving your child to just sit there uh, having this swirl of emotions that don't really totally make sense. It's, it's for me, the way I experienced it was just like, that annoys me and I don't know why. I didn't have the consciousness or the words to explain why. It would just be very annoying, very annoying, very annoying. And then only as an adult could I figure out why it was problematic. So the whole point is to not have the problematic. We're trying to, we're trying to help parents by saying these are problems so that you know they're problems That's and you right. can parent accordingly, right? That's right. Absolutely. We talk about three sides of every adoption. And so as the adoptive parents um, end up with the most power uh, after not feeling very powerful. Let me acknowledge that. So our, our decisions affect the other two positions in such a way. And we've covered some of the problematic behaviors of adoptive parents with adoptees. Kelsey, from your work with the birth parents, can you give us one or two problematic behaviors you see from adoptive parents? I can do that. Um, <laughs> I think one of the biggest things that we experience, well, I think all of the behaviors, most of the behaviors can be traced back to the insecurity of adoptive parents. Any issues that birth parents deal with with the adoptive parents can be traced back to that really big, ugly insecurity that kind of like burrows itself inside of an adoptive parent. Um, and so, because no matter how good of a relationship you have, there's like this potential um, ugliness that can come out that it feels like it's a competition when it shouldn't. It feels like it's always either or and never both and. It feels like um, you, you want me here out of obligation, not because you actually like me, value me, love me, um, want me to be in this child's life. Um, there's a lot of that kind of, uh, those behaviors, and it all comes back to insecurity and, um, and, and our presence kind of seems to aggravate that a lot of times. Um, I personally, um, in my personal adoption, I have an open adoption. I placed in 2016 um, and we still have an open adoption. It's changed over the years, um, but we've done a really, I think that we've done a pretty good job of, of kind of having those communication, having those conversations um, to address certain insecurities that either one of us are having. And I think um, where a lot of birth parents and adoptive parents run into those issues is when nobody is willing to have the conversation. There's a lot of denial of, 
of the behaviors that I'm sure that people know that they're doing, but they're not wanting to address them. They're not wanting to admit them. Um, and in the midst of all of that, there's this child who's like, okay, guys, are you going to figure it out or not? <laughs> because they're waiting for the adults to figure it out so they can have some breathing room. Um, I think I, I've seen like the insecurities present themselves in so many different behaviors. Um, a lot of it is really like just, it's, it's like this big mystery of what the other side is thinking. And then it's like, they think, oh, she's not responding to my text. So she doesn't want to be here anymore. She doesn't want to do this. She doesn't love my child. She doesn't want to um, have this relationship anymore. And so it's like, when you're not having those open communications, you're like making shit up in your head. So you're, I see a lot of that from adoptive parents. Um, and I see a lot of like retracting of like any kind of mercy for the other side. Like, oh, she's living like this, then no, you can't, no, she's out. Like she's, she can't be clean. She can't be sober. She's out forever. I, I think that there's not a whole lot of grace extended um, to people that have a whole different set of traumas, a whole different set of um, like a socioeconomic status. They have a whole different life um, and culture attached to them that when you are the adoptive parent and you hold all the power and you ref you have a big, a big pot of grace that you put the lid on and you refuse to give any of that away, um, that is reflecting upon your parenting, whether you think it is or not. And um, Basically, I guess what I'm trying to say is anything that you do that is a, a problematic behavior towards the birth parents is always going to come back to bite you um, and, and your child because you're, that's a reflection of the roots of your child and you have to acknowledge um, you have to acknowledge that or they're going to think there's something inherently wrong with them. Um, and really in this adoption, it it, I always try to, cause it, by nature, we're not, we don't want to center other people, right? Like we're, humans are selfish, but you have to keep um, readjusting yourself, realigning yourself and checking yourself to say like, I have to be centering the child. I want to do this, but I, but I'm not going to do that because it's not about me. So I think, um, you know, birth parents and adoptive parents both have to check those things. But I think when I think of anything problematic that happens, I now feel like I've trained myself to be like, how is this going to reflect on my son? Because, and how do we troubleshoot that before it gets to that point? Because you can hurt my feelings all day long. Um, and, and, you know, we can talk about birth parent support another day because they need support too. And I truly, truly believe that because they've also gone through trauma, but like, how is this at the end of the day going to reflect on my child? Because, you know, in honesty, when I made my placement decision, I did that for my child, whether or not it turned out to be the way that I wanted it to be, or I envisioned it to be, or, you know, what happened, that's why I did it. So like, I'm going to stick to that, even when my feelings get hurt and, and I'm shut out or what have you. I always think um, when I hear you and other birth parents speaking, I always yearn for like the thought of it being treated like a friendly divorce, right? Like it, it, yeah. it's just how you have to divorce. It's how you have to have an open adoption for the sake of the child. It has to, has to be with the child at heart, even though it's loaded emotionally. Um, right. And I see a lot of, I uh, just from working in agencies and, and seeing, um, especially just the landscape now where just like you said like there's these Facebook map matches happening that people barely know each other they barely get the time to know each other before you know they're chosen to parent this child and I see a lot of people online and you know the ones a lot of times the ones that um, 
need something more from what they have access to in their own adoption, even if they know everybody involved, like they are the ones that are online. They're searching for community. They're searching for more. They're searching for understanding. And, um, you know, I feel like there's a lot of mismatches out there. Like if there's, there's, yes, there's kids that probably should have never been adopted, but then second, there's these people that like what possessed them to pick them. I have no idea. They are not compatible people. Um, and then in turn, if that biological or if that child has a similar personality type to the birth parent, there's a lot of clashes with their adoptive parents. And so there's so many mismatches out there that I just am like, you know, you do have to treat it like a friendly divorce because you have to, you cannot have a relationship um, or you cannot not have a relationship at all because you're just, it's, it's so destructive more than it, way more than it needs to be. Um, so it is a really hard relationship. I feel like I, I feel, I genuinely feel like I have a good open adoption relationship and it's still really hard. It's really hard to watch someone parent your child, you know, you ask them to. And it's really hard um, to see your child and not know them. And so I feel like, and even though I do know him, there's so much I don't know, you know what I mean? So I, I feel like there's so many really weird feelings and my flight or, um, what is it? Why am I losing this word? Fight, my fight or flight. Why did I? Okay. <laughs> Anyways. There's a couple that, of F's that have been added to that, Kelsey. So you're yeah, not yeah. alone. Okay. It's growing. It yeah. is growing. <laughs> you know, I had a nap today. I'm a little foggy. <laughs> my fight or flight response is always telling me to run. And I'm sure that adoptive parents have the same, the same reflex that they're all constantly fighting. Because when something gets uncomfortable for me, it's like you're on a date. And you're like, sometimes it honestly is like, I'm on a date and I'm texting my friend. Um, can you call me with an emergency? Cause I, this is so uncomfortable. I have to get out of here. I honestly feel that way sometimes, even though we have a good relationship and whatever, but like, I, I have to constantly fight that. It's not about me. And adoptive parents have to do the same thing because I see so many, I, on these Facebook groups, I see them all the time. Like she did this. So I'm okay to close it, right? Because because she just she said this, she did this. I'm like, there's no handbook to this relationship. I don't know if you think that she has one that you don't. She's she has no idea how to navigate this either. So, yeah, I, it's a it's a tough one. It is like a divorce. I don't know if I've heard that before, Sarah, but it is really accurate. Because I always said it was like a marriage, but my marriage isn't like that. <laughs> I actually, I don't, and maybe this, you can, you can shut this down. Um, and maybe this is another, another ep episode or another discussion for you all to have is um, when I think about true openness and in the history of the 30 years, the definition of openness has changed drastically. Yeah. Old school openness was considered, you have a PO box somewhere in another state that neither one of the adoptive family or the birth family is from. It's in Utah, right? Or wherever. Everybody sends things to that. Then it gets shipped to these and dispersed and da, 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 right? It's not, there's nothing open about that in the way we define it today to the extreme, uh, which we call the extreme, which is literally co-parenting, right? Right, and, right? And so when I hear friendly divorce, I think about that's what comes up for me is, is that um, that is the co-parenting model because right. friendly divorce means I'm not stripping you of your parental rights. I'm just not. Right? right. And because right. I, right. my, and so that to me is very, that's the other side of what closed adoption is. I love the concept and I think we need to be moving more in that direction. Absolutely. Uh, and yet um, when parents hear that friendly divorce, I'm wondering if that's 
where their mind goes. Maybe. Collaboration is always going to be better for everybody, but especially the child than competition. And like you said, Kelsey, it so often gets because of that seed of insecurity. Um, it gets into the competition without people even knowing that it does. So I also think there's something to be said about just the nature of the beast. Like adoption is that. Like I, you did what I couldn't do in that moment. And, and like that creates a power dynamic. And so I do think that there is something to be said about this power dynamic that we are, we have to constantly chip away at and constantly fight against. Um, because everything about this arrangement is not natural. And right. so I, I do think there is like a force that we fight. I think I would also venture to guess that at times the adoptive parent, you know, it, it's, it starts off with the power dynamic reversed. So I'm sure that that, I can see how that would, those would vacillate and, and um, the insecurities playing off of each other. Um, yeah. I can see how that interplays. I, I was just appreciating Kelsey that you are um, so willing to talk about your perspective because I do think that helps with some of these problematic, you know, with the, the things we're talking about, the problematic, um, um, the, the problematic behaviors of like just the fight or flight, the adoptive parents mm. and that's it, we're leaving. Then to hear mm. you so vulnerably and openly share that this is what, what it's like for us. Mm. Like, I think that there's something that maybe that will stick with those who are listening that, you know, just to remember um, how, how it lands for you, how that, how that feels and that you are fighting something. And so for those who might go, they might not show up or they might, you know, they might not do what they said they're going to do. They're having a struggle. There's, they're, they're having, they might be yeah. in that flight mode and that doesn't mean don't hang in there. Mm. Right. Something that you said, Kelsey, that I just wrote down um, was that you said um, like to the adoptive parents, I feel like um, you didn't say it exactly, but I'm paraphrasing, but that um, you're doing something that I can't do or I couldn't do. Um, and hearing you say that um, in in my my heart, that's hard for me to hear. It's hard for me to hear because I think it's so much deeper than that. Um, I think I feel like it is. It's some uh, you're doing something that the system didn't give me the tools and resources right, to be right. able to figure out how to do. And that's right. that's that's taking the onus away from an individual um, and onto a system. And, and uh, you might have heard, I don't know if in this community, if you all call it an industry, but that's something that I have definitely started using and talking about. And I think that it's important for us to be um, defining and deciding what yeah. terms feel right for us, right? And I'm not right. saying that's the right term for anybody other than me. Um, I just feel like we, the, one of the reasons I use the term industry is, is because I do feel like this is, there's this, this big umbrella that um, is out there that is not offering support and resources so we could be doing it right. So we could be yeah. doing it in a healthy child-centered, birth-first parent-centered, adoptive parent-centered, adoptee-centered, all of these things, right? And so, mm -hmm. yeah, just, that's a, that was a- Yeah, really I think um, it's interesting because, yeah, I, I mean, this could be a whole separate episode, right? Like, um, I, I think- that is always the narrative and I know you know the the things that were stacked against me too but I think when we first come out of placement um like in our post-placement life that is the narrative that we heard the whole pregnancy and that is a narrative that we start to believe and then that's kind of where a downward spiral <laughs> kind of occurs typically so um and I also think that that part of that statement for me is kind of um in a way uh, taking responsibility for my part too. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think this is our longest episode ever, but I feel like we have so much more we can say too. So Austin, can you come back? Absolutely. Another time? We need to have a part two.
Yes, yeah. in part two, I would love to. I, and yeah. pick the topic and chances are I have something to say about it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel like, yeah, I feel like we named a few of the behaviors mm -hmm. and I hope it's helpful. I'm just going to recap, recap. So um, jump in if I'm forgetting anything, but I think one mm -hmm. is teachability, right? Mm -hmm. Like being an openness to learn. I think that's like, don't be closed off, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, any of us really. But um, I think just that, that don't, don't be the one in the room doing this. Watch, thank mm -hmm. you for listening. If you stuck with this mm -hmm. video this far, um, being teachable mm -hmm. um, and um, not oversharing, not over oversharing your child's story, getting really clear with yourself on the boundaries um, and uh, of that story for the adoptee and how that gets messaged and what is yours to share your story versus what is the adoptees part of it um, and how those interact. Um, I, would just, I just yeah. want to add the word yeah. modeling, right? Yeah, yeah. modeling and so yes. that when you sure. are doing this, yeah. you are modeling to your child your future child as they grow up so they've got that voice and the agency when right. they when they are that in that same position yes yeah. um and not withholding grace <laughs> for anybody for the birth parent but i think that goes all the way around right like that's huge we all need to everybody right now needs that um but that's a big one not making it about about them, not making it about you, the adoptive parent, remembering and kind of fast forwarding and uh, keeping the child's best, not remembering the child's best interest. So um, kind of, I guess I'm talking solutions at this point rather than the problems. Anything else that we touched on so much? So that was what I jotted down. I love Lori's three, three tips. Yes. yes. I wanted to maybe close my section with a, or my, thoughts with a message to adoptive parents who are listening that um, you, you guys have brought you all have brought up so many good things, especially that insecurity piece. I think for adoptive parents that drives all the problematic behavior, or at least it, can, it explains a lot of it. And the way to interrupt that insecurity to problematic behavior um, connection is with openness. And Astrid and Sarah, you both mentioned this, and I just picture closed people who once they get their baby, they want it all to be done and over and all the hard parts are behind and we just aren't going to deal with it. Nothing else is going to happen. We won't need any tools to happen because it just, we're all good. We're all good. So I'm going to call them Carl and Carla, or, you know, don't be like Carl and Carla, because if you can be like Olivia and Oliver, um, then you have this open stance. You are curious. You can be child-centered. You have grace to give. You're modeling giving grace to yourself because you're going to make mistakes, but you're going to, you know, continue to be open and an open system where you continually do things better. So I just think that I, I know I'm a broken record on all the work I do, but openness is such an antidote to the problems that we, that adoptive parents, um, the problematic behaviors we have and the problems we cause for others because of that behavior. Well, this was wonderful. Again, I feel like there's more to say, mm -hmm. um, but we'll we'll do a, a, a part two or another one with Ostrid on mm -hmm. another topic because we there are so many. Um, and thank you. Thanks for joining us. A reminder to subscribe and um, we'll see you next time. Take care. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone. Thanks, yeah, thank you.